backing away. Hillisang going in with the quickness, can't land it. Oh! Comes on to Reckless, the final spark doesn't land, but Reckless is chased out. Hillisang there as well. Jensen gets the double! And Fnatic are on to the Nexus. They look to end it here. TSM has nothing to say. Nexus drew it number one down. Nexus drew it number two down. And Fnatic will secure the Rift Rivals win for Europe. Welcome everyone to another Esports in 30. I'm Brody Moore filling in for Lisa and this is Matt Hampstead and today we're breaking down Rift Rivals between NA and EU. Now yesterday was Canada's birthday but that didn't give North America any help. Uh, Europe was pretty dominant. Yes. What did we see go down this weekend? Well, uh, it was one of the, the least exciting tournaments of all time because it's <laughs> Rift Rivals, right? Which no one cares about. The only time it was actually really fun was back in, like I think it was the first year when Mike Young was on Phoenix 1 and no one uh -huh. knew who he was and he popped off and everyone thought he was a god uh -huh. and then he wasn't a god, uh, which Rip. was <laughs> Pretty nice, but yeah, it was, it was just a weird tournament. G2 was trolling. Uh, some of the NA teams had mm -hmm. health issues. Uh, we saw subs get some play. So, if you want a super competitive competition, this isn't it. But it was still pretty fun to see NA and EU go head to head. And of course, mm -hmm. EU won. Surprise. Well, why don't we stop talking about it and get into some of the action before we call up the Nico the Pico? Let's roll some of the highlights from Rift Rivals. Sees Mickey X here. Going to go flash forward. The binding does manage to connect with the barriers there. Smoothie now running for his life. The shield, rather. And now first blood. Oh, flash down oh. the stolen summoner. Reckless and Hillisang just dance Backing there. away. Hillisang going in with the quickness. Can't land it. Oh. Jensen jumps onto Reckless. The final spark doesn't land. But Reckless is chased out. Hillisang there as well. Jensen gets the double. All the way around to the top side of the map. Blackwish now joining with his mid laner. Going into Boxer, trying to get the kill onto this at least. But Niski has to flash away. TP coming in for Fnatic. And now Blackwish is stuck in a very sticky situation. Stunned up, locked down. Fnatic, take two. This is a 1v1, though. You got to get out of there. And yeah, Niski needs to get away, but doesn't <laughs> have the flash. And Whippo can chase him down. Knock back into the team. Blackwish going for the stun here. Counter Strike will connect. The stun lands off Whippo, and he's very low. Niski gets the kill. Now, C9 going to keep it on the offensive. Stepping forward into the faces of Fnatic. But Reckless has a flank position and Nemesis takes one. Boxer pushing forward here as well and lands a cocoon onto Niski, trying to dodge around, but Niski eventually will go down. The Fnatic take Nexus and strike first here for Europe. Forced away, doesn't have the flash running. Ghost on the Olaf and first blood goes to Origin. All of Origin on their way down towards this bottom side. Vissel Boy is used as well. There's the final chapter, catches out three. And now Sven is in for a world of hurt. How far he turns onto him. The world ender coming in the flash forward. TSM running for the hills, but the chase is on from Origin. But the rest of Origin are on the Nexus Towers, trying to keep Grig from getting back to the fountain, but he will escape. How far he's popped the world ender, but the Nexus is in Origin's sight. Gergsen has to do something miraculous here to stop it. But TSM can't defend, and Origin make it 2-0 for Europe. Does have another charge of the Q. Caps goes for it. Caps looking to make this play happen, but Jensen going forward! Caps going in. A lot of damage coming out there. A nice Caps goes through, and now Caps in some trouble! Bam! Jensen blasted down! There's your final spark, and Yankos will now find himself in the middle of four members of Team Liquid. There's the ulti being forced out of Hurts here immediately. Impact in some trouble! Oh. Rooted up a man! Damage on that health bar in with the auto attacks. Jensen's oh. able to find a knockoff! Perks in some trouble, gets him the ultimate there in time. Gonna be taking very, very low! Oh! And true shot barrage! American Sniper Devil and finds his <laughs> man! And Yankos will follow! Guardian Angel will bring him back to life, only to die a second death! Mickey runs off the side, G2 goes into the spaces, now they're gonna be cut down even further! Ladies and gentlemen, Team Liquid will not be brought down today! We have ourselves a series! Team Liquid wins game three. Broxe is here. It will be a two versus two. Bjergsen goes ahead, throws Nemesis back, but now Bjergsen's gonna be taken very low. He's stuck in the cage. He can't step on the side. Having a dodge, duck, dip, dive, and dodge, but first blood still over to Fnatic. Whippo going into the front line. They're gonna find the chains, and there's your reset. Smoothie is oh, gone. Whippo. Whippo's going crazy. He goes into the resurrection. TSM barely walking themselves away. Broken blade in the back. Whippo's able to find the double. Nemesis swoops in. Smoothie again, the target. Not pulled back by the chain. Griggs' ulties are just not there! Bjergsen has to flash away. Whipple's still gonna be tanking on the front line. Nexus turret number one down. Nexus turret number two down. And Fnatic will secure the Rift Rivals win for Europe.
Europe absolutely had their way with North America as they continue to show that they are the superior region. To help us go over Rift Rivals, we've got Nico the Pico on the line. Grats on the EU win. How you feeling, buddy? <laughs> oh, feeling great. Can't complain. All right, so I'm uh, I'm uh, kind of the outsider here. I'm taking place of, of Lisa, as, as we've uh, mentioned, but uh, I'm going to let you guys just go off on this right now then. Yeah, so I mean, let's just start with the results because Europe won the finals three games to one. It wasn't very close except for Team Luka putting up some good results. So how far ahead do you think Europe is after watching them compete in this uh, against the top three from North America? I think uh, North America making it to semifinals in MSI was uh, a fluke, and I don't think anybody <laughs> really actually expected that, and I don't think they really deserved it. And I think that it just shows the level of quality that uh, Europe has and how far above the top three European teams are from the top three NA teams. And I think that gap is increasing for every day that goes, and NA is falling behind. So, so what is it that is doing better than North America? Like, can you break it down to a specific quality? Uh, well, how many NA mid laners do you have at this tournament? The Rift Rivals. <laughs> like, there is like there is so few NA players, and there's so few organizations that are willing to fully. Uh, commit to uh, North American talent and develop it, then Euro Europe is just much better at developing talent and there's like an overflow of extremely good mid laners that you can build teams around and that's why you see every team has European mid laners pretty much. And uh, yeah, I, I think it's um, maybe just the solo queue atmosphere and the, the culture of pushing each other and the amount of teams who are willing to invest in, in talent and maybe also even the structure that is below the LEC in Europe, where you now have all the national leagues who are doing really great, the Spanish league and the German league, where you actually have teams that are committing huge amount of resources to help build the newer talent. And that just grows the entire ecosystem and the scene and that strengthens everybody. So it's, it's less of a play style thing and more of just a, a lack of depth of skill pool when it comes to the players. Yeah. I think that is a huge, a huge reason here. Yeah. I mean, you don't see any teams really commit to rookies that often, um, mm. but you see Fnatic, who like, in the finals, they went 2-0 and against TSM and C9, and they, they just embraced a bunch of rookies like Nemesis. Mm -hmm. uh, they also beat G2 in week three. So right now, do you think they're currently the team to beat in Europe, or does that title still belong to G2? I think G2 is... is they're actually just too troll, I think. Like, uh, yeah. But both the gamers as Fnatic... Like, they're trying so many different things, and they're like uh, lane swapping caps to the top lane who has no clue how to play the top lane or how to, to, to utilize his pressure there, and went to back off and went to push up. And they're, they're, they think they're so incredibly good, which they are, that they can actually just troll on the other teams. I think if G2 took that game 100% serious and they were like, like life or death on that game versus Fnatic, Fnatic would not win. Even with Broxa performing out of his mind and like a world class jungler. Uh, performance. Uh, I, I think that once G2 get enough slaps in their face where they actually wanted to start taking their competition serious, they're hard to beat right now and both perks and caps are just out of their mind and just watch the games of Mickey playing Yumi for example and like it's their players are so individually good like the the only horse stalling for them I feel is Jankos which is very back and forth but all the other four players are just yeah, best in class. So it's it's like, I mean, just looking at the overall uh, feel of this, you know, I think uh, players probably take it a, a little less seriously, but do you think that's an opportunity for them to start to run with some weird compositions, like, and actually test stuff out? Or is it all just, we're not thinking about anything and just throwing anything out there? <laughs> um, so I do think that that is a huge opportunity because they have a, a, a way broader opportunity to actually test different sort of composition, test lane swaps, test, uh, like new champions and, and really just go ham and test everything and they obviously get so much more information on new champions and different structures and different compositions lane swapping they get all this experience that the other teams don't have the chance to to, to risk and try because maybe losing two games trying something new is going to make it so that you don't make playoffs for example and and teams are not willing to risk that but g2 like they're so confident that like they're gonna make playoffs, they're gonna be number one, number two, which is extremely likely. Even if they they roll swap everybody and everybody's taking each other's position, and we have Pike Jungle and everything, so of course there's value in them doing it. But at the same time, we're not gonna see the full strength of G2 until they start yeah. taking things serious. And when they start taking things serious, uh, maybe they haven't gotten it practiced in as much as they they would have liked to. Mm -hmm. So it's gonna be very interesting once that actually happens.
Yeah, I doubt we're going to see any of those Shivana top uh, yeah. games coming out once they go back to the LEC. But for North America, there was one bright spot, which was actually Team Liquid. They beat two, uh, they beat G2 twice, one of which was kind of a, a meme win, but it still counts. Uh, still so counts. What, what are your thoughts on Team Liquid after they were able to get some mild revenge from MSI? Uh, I, I'm sorry, but I don't think these matches matter anything or showcase yeah. anything. Uh, one thing that is really important that people keep in mind that whoever wins and whatever is shown at Rift Rivals doesn't actually matter for uh, the LCS teams or the LEC teams. And the matches that they're going to play in the next week in their home region in LEC or in LCS matters way more. So they, they have to balance this about uh, we don't want to show stuff that we are going to use next week. We don't want to give uh, the teams that we're playing too big of an opportunity to scout us. But at the same time, we want to get valuable practice time. So it's like you're balancing a lot of things and in, in the back of your head, you know that this doesn't matter anything. It doesn't help you get closer to Worlds or anything. So it's like high-level scrims or high-level practice where you're trying a bit more than you would normally do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that obviously it's a huge motivational boost for Team Liquid probably. I don't think G2 cares at all. I don't think any European team thinks about it twice. Uh, I don't mm -hmm. think it's going to change anything in a, in a best of three or a best of five or even a best of one when G2 actually wants to win. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a good motivational boost, and yeah, it's good for them. Kind of yeah, back yeah, at least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you know, I, interesting uh, thought here. So uh, C9, because they had um, a situation where Sneaky got sick, uh, right? Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm just thinking now, uh, this is something that players aren't taking uh, you know, as seriously, and it's like you're putting your players now through a bit more than they maybe should when they should be focusing on league play. Should they maybe start using a bit more of their subs in these kind of events to give them more experience rather than main rosters? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how the sub situation was for Rift Rivals. Normally for international events, you're allowed to bring two subs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, if they didn't have an ADC sub and that's what they had to do, then that's what they had to do. But the thing that I'm wondering about, obviously I don't know what the situation of Sneaky was and maybe like something horrible happened, but I wonder if he would have called in sick if this was actually an important game and, yeah. or an important tournament. And you look back in the past, you have double lift with his dad um, dying straight before the finals, yeah. he still shows up for the finals. You have so many different situations where, you know, all the horrible is going down. You have uh, players puking right before the match yeah. and pausing the game to go and puke. And, you know, like, you got to be really, 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 really sick to not want to play important matches. Mm -hmm. And I really wonder if Sneaky would have played, and I think he would have played if this actually matters. Mm -hmm. And... It is what it is. I, I think with the sub situation, obviously, uh, the most valuable subs that you can bring if you can only bring two are people that can actually fill all the other roles and actually play half decent. Right. Uh, and I don't think they had that. So that's why we ended with the situation that we had, which was obviously really sad because Niski was performing out of his mind and he yeah. he, he really wanted to make an A pride uh, proud and he, he, he did himself. But I, I think that if Sneaky was playing, <laughs> yeah, yeah, if Sneaky was playing, I think Cloud9 would have actually surprised uh, at the tournament because okay. Niski was just performing so damn good. Yeah, it's pretty tough to win when you put your sub jungler mid and then bot, and you move your mid laner <laughs> bot. It's just, it was a total mess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Rift Rivals was a pretty weird event, obviously. Yeah, we're, we're, been through. <laughs> we're talking about it here. I mean, it's in the middle of the summer split, too. Um, a lot of the players are like half in or not in at all. Yeah, no. <laughs> um, so what do you think should be done with this tournament? Because clearly it's kind of losing its luster after like the first couple of years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and obviously for the fans too, you have all the teams talking about long before Rift Rivals even starts that, oh, I really don't want to go to Rift Rivals. We're losing so much valuable time. We could have rather had a, a break week or, or, or like uh, had a, a chiller week to reset and, and gain more energy for our league because everything that matters in Summer Split is qualifying to Worlds. There's nothing else that actually matters. So, uh, a good suggestion that uh, that was flowing around on Reddit and Twitter and stuff like this was actually having sort of a World Cup where mm. you have uh, national representatives uh, from all the nations that play league, which is pretty much everywhere in the world, mm -hmm. but you don't invite the top teams. So, whoever's in the actual leagues like uh, LEC or LCK or LPL mm -hmm. or, or LCS, you know, 
they have this week where they just scrim and practice and do whatever they want. And you invite the best teams from all the regions below it, but representing their nation. So you, for example, have a Norwegian team and a Danish team and a Romanian team and a Chinese team. And you make a World Cup and you have the casters and you have the production team from LCS and from uh, LEC or even bring in uh, LPL and LCK and like actually make a really well broadcasted and casted event uh, as a World Cup. You will have so many nations who are finally getting to to support their players and support their their home country who, who right now don't have any players in the different leagues and i think it would be a really good opportunity it could be a really hype event it would be a really cool opportunity for teams to scout players in a high pressure environment and yeah you could make it really cool and then you don't affect these teams that are trying to get to worlds that's no that's that's, that's honestly i think i think just uh, representing especially uh, not having the top teams, just representing a bunch of this talent from around the world that uh, and showcasing them in a professional environment, I think would be incredibly yeah, useful. I mean, Overwatch does it. Why can't League of Legends do it? It makes a lot of sense. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm down for that. Um, but we're going to keep you around, uh, Nico, right now, though. Uh, with Rift Rivals wrapped up, it's time to get back with the summer split. With all the focus on the top three from Europe, let's check out how the rest of the LEC has been holding up. Fighting starting to turn, Jizuke, not a lot left, uses the stolen Here's hero of Akabo in the midst of everything, and that's a meat grinder right there, Vitality with the turn of the back of Cabo Shard. Forced to go cold, and the Sark and the Sona are surviving for now, Targ already dead, Azira alive, Jizuke uses the stolen ultimate, Mickey, to be help. available, taking down Cabo Shard, what else can he get, Jizuke, the sun now comes out, Mickey uses the ultimate, he gets pushed back, no, it's the stolen ultimate coming through, Mowgli now in trouble, he's going to get eaten up by the Tomcat, can they continue to extend this play, Jizuke moving forward, that's the Crescendo trying to delete the Sona, but no, the Seraph's race is still there. Mowgli taken down, Cabo on the backside. Attila, though, free firing into the back line. The forest is untouched. And they'll take the win. Vitality, first win on the board. So that's another time secured. Look at Crown Shot go in. self mids on his way, Hunt Summer already so low. Maxwell chunked out. First blood, 20 minutes, 50 seconds it took. Oh. No ultimate. Teleport in behind Hunt Summer as well. And maybe the AD carry from Mitzvah is overstepped. In fact, I'm pretty sure he has. Sakura coming in behind enemy Ooh, lines. Low stuff there, but they're looking for the kill anyway. Oh, in with the Nar. Oh, indeed. Forbidden TPs. And that's the story of Misfits right now. Tower goes down. Nexus Tower falling to a super minion as well. The suppression lands. So let's try to jump on the back line. They're all in on crown shot. But he's devoured just in time and he gets away. Sakura kills Maxlaw. Gorilla down as well. And Sakura is somehow still alive. Forbidden will kill him in the end. But that's the double across towards the Nar. They solidify their position as a playoff team as they take down Misfits. The team eyes on Attila, though he's doing so much damage and he's uncontested. Exhaust, Exhaust will go down. self made getting picked off on the backside. Pyrian needs to go in. They're Are they going to try to finish it? They definitely want to get it, but self made is down. Can they get it? Will they get taken away in the end? Yes, they do, but they pay the greatest price they can. TP is now coming in. Zuki's already stolen the cannon on one sleep right in the midst of everything. Crouch out throwing out so much damage. They're all grouped up for the Zai. Is it going to be enough? Though the Zimmer now coming in the turn. Jazuke finding the stolen ultimate. Crouch out is still alive, but it will not be enough. Point and click him down. Attila will find the kill. The double for Cabo Shark. Vitality will find their second win of the split. This 2v2 is absolutely doomed from Splice. Oh, oh the flash forward. North Gary trying to make it up. Double teams will connect. They're totally committing. Splice taking the page for the Fnatic playbook. And Patrick now in trouble. Goodbye to the Draven. Freeze frame as fire rains from the sky in a double kill. Xerxes incredibly low. However, the knockup is there coming from North Gary. They're just going to immediately delete one member. Kabe is still alive. Patrick in the midst of everybody. Mr. Chachi with a big off the shutdown onto the Draven. Look at That's two. That's three. OG desperately trying to make a last stand. The flash forward. The Randowitz. Mithy will drop. How far? is next trying to get the barbecue splice will take down origin and raise the question who really is the third best team in europe yeah that's right despite origin going to rift rivals splice is currently third in the lec standings and now nico let's bring it back in here it seems like splice is always flying under the radar as of right now could you put them in the top three in europe well they are but like consistently I don't feel it. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't see it. I don't feel it. Uh, I think they they could be somewhat of a dark horse, maybe, mm -hmm. but I, I just don't think they're strong enough uh, on paper straight. And and it, it's much more realistic that you have a team like Origin or even Schalke come in there and and, and take mm -hmm. that last third spot. I think it's uncontested that Fnatic and G2 are uh, number one and two. 
Um, I think the fight for third is going to be tough, but I would much rather put my money on Origin and Schalke if I had to. So what's the what's the question mark really for here uh, for Splice? Is it it's simply just to do, as you said, with on paper, the roster is not what you want to see, or is there something that they could do yeah. to convince you? Like, if you look at the, the other rosters, like if you look at Origin, you look at Schalke, like you have players who will really pop off and just carry the game on their back. And you have multiple on them in different roles. And I look at Splice and they're like, really consistent. They're, they're just really consistent players. So they're consistently able to be middle, middle top of the pack. Yeah. But I don't see those players who's just gonna carry everybody on their back and just pop off and just like have all the highlights on them and, and just take them to finals, you know? I, I don't see that. potential. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like maybe Humanoid will be that guy and he's just gonna be able to pop off at some point, but right now I don't see it. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. So in week four, uh, Splice is playing the undefeated Fnatic, and obviously you probably don't think they have a chance, but uh, how, do you how do you think they should approach this matchup? Is it another situation of just try to get Kabi ahead and allow him to get to late game until he can carry by himself? Uh, it depends on whether Fnatic is going to play Dan in the jungle or whether they're going to play Broxa. Right. I think that's two completely different approaches and two different uh, playstyles that you're playing versus. I, I think that still, as of today, that Weepo is the real weak point of Fnatic and he's the most exploitable member. Okay. Uh, I think everybody else is doing really, really good and they're really solid. I also think that the Broxa game versus G2, I uh, like, I literally went and wrote him like directly while the game was happening because it was just so beautiful to see and I think Broxa is like peaking his performance right now so I, I think if, if Broxa is able to protect Repo and, and just cancel out the opportunity of, of uh, going on Repo then it's going to be extremely hard and yeah you, you might need Humanoid to do some crazy stuff in the mid lane in order to have any chance in that match. <laughs> All right, I want to talk about uh, Vitality here because uh, it took until week three for them to finally get their first win of summer. Now they're currently two and four and still very much in the race. Do you think they have what it takes to keep their ascension going? Uh, Vitality <laughs> has been really lackluster this split. I, I feel like they were they were doing this play style that was really crazy and, and it was working and they were getting enough wins, but then people figured it out. Like the team started figuring them out and then they didn't get any more wins and... I feel like this split, they're, they're like a dead fish, so you're like waiting for them to do something. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, Magic card, splash. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. but they, they have good players, but I'm just not seeing it. Like Mowgli should be, he should be a top jungler in EU, but it it just isn't showing yet. And I, I, I think right now the bot lane is really lackluster. And, and I, I want Yusuke to go back and make the place and, and really carry his team on the back because we know he can do it. But as of recently, like, they're not really doing it. And the wins they have, it's not like from pop-off performances, which Vitality is known from. It's more like just just winning that last team fight and then being able to close it out. And yeah, it's not really impressing me right now. And I, I don't have big expectations for them. So is this, do you think it's like a, a motivational issue for the players? Do you think it's like a, a lack of kick from, you know, the behind the scenes, the synergy? Well, like what, what is it that's, you know, not letting these players get to where they can be? Well, I think when you have a really good working team and you're able to consistently do good and you're able to go playoffs and, and, and get high places and then suddenly everything stops working. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's probably a, a million different issues that are causing it and you just have to start handling it one by one and trying to get back to it. I think that Yamato Cannon is doing everything that he can and, and to, to actually help it back but there also might be motivational issues from the players. I don't know how Mowgli is handling EU. He's the only Korean on the team. I know from my own experience that one Korean on the team usually leads to mental booms uh, because it's just it's just you get two alone and you get sort of split and your English isn't perfect. You don't want to speak English if it's not perfect. And mm. um, maybe what's needed is actually that they get another Korean just just to have somebody there that Mowgli can rely on and, and bond with. Because yeah. I think that Mowgli Mowgli is the dark horse of this team and you get Mowgli rolling, he's going to he's going to take control. Yeah, it's especially hard, too, in the, the Koreans in the jungle, because that's such an important role about communication, too, so it's hard yeah. for him yeah. to you know, just get involved. Yeah. No, I, I can definitely see that, just being out of your zone, out of your element, knowing that, yeah. you know, like, yeah, you're, you're the only one it's there tough. that can't, like, communicate as well. Yeah, that's for really sure. tough. Uh, let's talk about SK Gaming for a bit, because they just always seem to be in the middle of the pack. I mean, in spring, they finished 9-9, and nine, and now in summer, they're currently 3-3. Three and three. What does SK Gaming have to do to actually break away from their middle-of-the-road results and actually start challenging some of these top teams? Uh, I think SK is a really, really fun team. Uh, they brought in Sakura from uh, yeah. straight from EU Masters. He had a really good performance there, and I think it's really cool that they're willing to to 
bring up their newer talent and, and really work on them. I, th I think that Selfmade has shown that he can be a pop-off performer player. Uh, I think that Pyrian can have his really, really good games, but it's not consistent enough. I think uh, Crownshot and Dreams can, can have really stellar performances in the game, and I, I think they just need to find their style. Like, they need to really find their identity, and once they find their identity and they're just able, able to just form out their identity and follow through on it and, and optimize it, I think that SK can do really good. I think there's a lot of potential in all their players, and yeah, I, I actually have faith that they can go far once they just figure out their stuff and they're able to work on it. Yeah, it looks like self-made. It's not just the... Put every, all the eggs in the self-made basket and let, actually just let them take over now. It's a yeah. more involved uh, team, which is cool to see. Yeah. Now, uh, let's talk about the Misfits then. Uh, they're continuing on with their disappointing results. <laughs> <laughs> They've also been uh, heavily experimenting with, uh, experimenting, sorry, with other players on the roster. Moose from Misfits says that he thinks the seven-man roster is the best route for playoffs. What are your thoughts on uh, this and Misfits shuffling the roster? Uh, I think if Misfits wants to have a chance, they uh, bench Maxlor and Fabivan definitely, indefinitely, and then they put Leader and they put Kirei in, and they actually develop them as talents. Like, look at this roster and look at the Fnatic roster in 2017 that I built once we took Broxa in and took Amazing out. You had Soas, you had an uh, up-and-coming super good jungler with high mechanical skill, you have a super mechanical high-skilled mid laner who can pop off and, and carry games by himself, and you have huge uh, like veterancy in your ball lane with Hansama and Gorilla. Like, it, it's pretty much the same setup as I had in Fnatic 2017. And I think that continuing on with this Forbidden Max lore stuff, it's just not working. And, and whenever they play, it's been like, uh, it's, it's actually so sad to see. And I don't think that these teams that go five veterans will really work. Mm. I think you need these players that are younger, who are willing to listen, who are willing okay. to, to, to just take from the others and, and, and push through and, and work on themselves and bring the motivation and bring the drive to, to really push the team. And I think that you saw the, the games where Kira was playing. Uh, when both of them was playing, obviously when Leader had his, had his first game, they uh, didn't do so well. But yeah. I, I still believe that that's the route to go. And that's the way where you make Misfits a top team. You have these incredibly good uh, young and rookie players who are willing more than anything to give everything to to make it to playoffs and go further. And, and I just don't see it in Fabivan and Maxwell, and they're honestly just disappointed. Yeah, I mean, it seems like so many EU teams are willing to take a chance and put some of those, especially mid laners, just put them in and, and hope they perform. But why do you think they're so hesitant to, to go with leader instead of Febivin? Is it just like, uh, you know, we signed him last year, we kind of promised him a starting spot, and now they're trying to, to ease him out and still compete for playoffs? I think when you have players like Febivin and Maxlor, it is really, 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 really difficult to permanently bench them, right. unless there's like some insane reason for it. Um, I think that's why they're swapping back and forth, but at some point too, you gotta do what's best for your team and you gotta be willing to pull the trigger. It's obviously probably gonna be a huge economic sink because uh, yeah. it's not gonna be cheap putting uh, Fabian and Maxler on the bench and depending on how the contract is and everything, and there might be huge drama for the academy team as well. And it, it's obviously hard when you have these veteran superstar players that yeah. everybody knows mm -hmm. and everybody recognizes who's bringing a huge fan base and stuff. Like, it's just like, Fanatic, like if they wanted to to bench Reckless, or if you have G2 yeah. wanting to bench Caps or Perks, like that is going to be storm, and you got to be very careful about doing it. But when the situation is that you actually need to do it in order to even make playoffs, you should be willing to do it. If nothing is working and you have an opportunity that may uh, might work, then go for it. Like be willing to take the risk. Otherwise. Just like you're just gonna rot and die. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, <laughs> well put. I, I feel like it can help out too. You know, at, at last second, you do that last ditch effort just to keep yourself in the game. I think people are gonna be surprised by it. They're gonna love it. You take off those main names that people, everyone, uh, everyone knows about, throw in uh, yeah. these players. I think, I think that could be a cool shock value too that brings a lot of people watching as well. So, yeah, yeah. sure. I appreciate that they're trying, but at one point it's got to be like, look, there's there's six weeks left. We need to start yeah. winning games. So let's let's, let's get <laughs> it rolling. Do something. Yeah. Um, exactly. and, Anyways, we're going to let you go in a few, but uh, I just one last question for you since we've been talking about Fnatic and G2. Uh, why don't we uh, compare them? Fnatic's been looking great, and G2 are the MSI champions. So which t uh, team do you think is going to be the summer split champion? Uh, I think it depends on Broxa, 
and Buipo for Fnatic, and I think it depends on uh, Jankos and Wunder for G2. I think that Caps is obviously stronger than Nemesis, and there's no duel there, but if, if Fnatic go in with a good strategy where Nemesis is not going to be the, the point of failure, I think that is that is going to be fine. I think uh, Fnatic bot lane uh, should be able to beat the Perks lane. I, I know that Perks has been performing out of his mind, but I still believe that Reckless, when it counts, he's going to show the veterancy and the ADC that he can really be. So I think it comes down to the upper part of the map, you know, like if Buipo is going to crash into the wall, then then Fnatic will lose. And if Buipo is able to actually perform and play good, then Fnatic has a chance that you get a really close series. And then you have the situation with Brox and Jankos where Brox recently has just been performing like a god and, and Jankos is not impressing. So <laughs> I, I think there's opportunities. And I think uh, I really, really hope that we just get a really close series and it's going to be super hype five games and long games and bloody games and that is just going to be good for the entire ecosystem and i think they they push each other a lot Fnatic and g2 and they're really healthy for each other and i think that no matter what if they both go to worlds and represent us you know we're not going to complain it doesn't matter who wins or loses in the finals yeah, interesting you didn't pick misfits there uh, that's well, that's odd ain't no belief in the in the school. <laughs> no, uh, ain't no belief <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome anyways Nico, it's always a pleasure having you on the show thank you so much for joining and as much as it means to you enjoy that rift rivals win over NA. <laughs> <laughs> my pleasure thank you all right nico was great but matt it's you time so oh, we no. have just a, a few minutes left so before we go i need to know who is your MVP from Rift Rivals? I'm going to use my time to steal an answer from Nico because, okay. I mean, he, he basically said it, right? He was like, Brox has been playing like a god. Mm -hmm. And in a tournament like Rift Rivals, it's kind of hard to be like, this guy's the best player because they're all kind of playing half-ass. I mean, G2's trolling with mm -hmm. weird picks. Origin's playing fine, but again, it's not the, the top-tier competition. Yeah, but yeah. Broxo was one guy still who kind of stands out because, you know, uh, Nico was alluding to how Whippo was kind of the hit-or-miss point. Well, Broxo can kind of prevent that from happening depending on how he's playing. If he's staying top and reading the map properly, then he can be like, okay, they're going to target Whippo, and we can try to stave that off and not let it happen. Mm -hmm. And he's been doing that, and that's why they beat G2 uh, back in L L LEC Week 3. That's why they were performing the best of the EU teams in Rift Rivals. Maybe it's also because they were trying the most um, but but I think Brox is just this guy who, who's kind of the new fuel to Fnatic's engine and it's, it's very impressive to see him playing the way he is even though he's really not that old in the, the EU scene so gotta give it to Brox and we'll see if he can keep it going well, in week four. I don't know enough about this so I can't disagree with him so we're <laughs> nice. gonna end this up that's all we got for today's esports in 30 special thanks to Nico for chatting with us today don't miss tomorrow's show because we're talking everything CEO until then check out all our socials at Squad Tate we'll see you tomorrow